whoever scheduled this, I appreciate the one-on-one access. <laughs> Just talk about the early practices, Coach, and what what you like about your team now that you've got them on the floor every day. Yeah. The, the biggest thing I'm happy about with the team so far is they're giving the effort. You know, that's one thing I haven't had to coach here so far is, like, guys are giving a genuine effort in practice. Um, the other thing is, like, guys are being coachable. There's a lot of new information being thrown at them in a short amount of time, and they haven't fought us as far as, like, you know, trying to grasp the information and use it. Um, but the biggest thing we want to keep uh, making sure we're doing is like our guys are playing hard and playing tough. So I've been pleased with that so far. Offensively, we got to learn how not to turn the ball over. You know, I told them that's the worst thing they can do. And I was joking that maybe we got to get it, uh, Dan Mullins punter over there so we can just punt it out of bounds and not give it to the other team at times. But uh, other than that, as far as like offensively, our guys have been playing with some freedom and, and doing some good things. We just got to make sure we're taking care of the basketball. Are you surprised? You've talked about that for a while, that you guys are playing hard and you haven't had to, you know, kind of stick the cattle prod in their leg a little bit. Are you surprised by that, or, or is it that maybe they didn't know what hard was and you had to kind of get them to understand what hard was, or was that not an issue? Well, I'm a little surprised by it. It, it used to be when I first started this business that, like, playing hard was, you know, taken for granted. And now playing hard and playing tough has almost become a skill level, you know, something that you check off on when you go and evaluate kids. So, you know, that's the one thing I think our guys have brace, you know, it's like the embrace is the fact that they're going to go out there and play hard. Just talk about what you see from Jalen Steele early on. Well, you know, I think the biggest thing is like Jalen is, is a great person as far as like the way he handles his business you know like he, he has a business like approach to the game of basketball and so he comes in he shoots early and he stays and he shoots late um the other thing is too is like you need a guy out there who's a lethal shooter that can space it you know the defense and i think he's taking on that role and you know he's an unbelievably hard worker and i think that he's going to be a good player for us it's now like can he take the attention that he's going to receive you know it used to be that he was probably the third or fourth guy on the scouting report that you know now he's probably going to be the first guy on the scouting report and so can he handle those duties rick it's early can you talk about where you see the strengths of your team being? <laughs> yeah that's real early for <laughs> i don't know what our strengths are yet you know like uh, our guys are still still trying to figure out the way we want them to play and what we expect out of them i, I would say right now like the biggest thing as far as like our strength is our, our ability to shoot the basketball with Jalen still and fred thomas and Kyle Walker. Those guys have done a good job of shooting the basketball so far. Um, so, but I don't know if they'll get those opportunities or not if we don't have guys that can penetrate and get inside and throw the ball inside to Wendell and have those guys score. Because if we don't have any sort of like a threat as far as like getting to the paint, whether by post feeds or by the dribble penetration, then those guys will never get opportunities to shoot the ball. Talk about West Plenty and what he brings to your side. Well, the biggest thing is I've known Wes Flanagan for a long time. He was an AAU coach when I was an assistant at Indiana State, and I recruited several of his players. Didn't always get them, but I always appreciated the way Wes handled his business, and I've seen Wes you know, rise in his co in the coaching ranks. And, um, the big thing about Wes is, first and foremost, he's a constant professional. Uh, I think, first of all, like he is understanding he's played basketball in the SEC, and he's a really good player at Auburn. But more importantly, he's a good man. And so they can look to him as far as like the way they should go about their business and live their life. And he's a loyal guy and you know, obviously the recruiting ties he has in the South is, you know, is is really gonna be good for us because now I thought when I first got the job, you know, you had to sell three things. You know, you had to sell, you know, Mississippi State, you know, you had to sell me, and then you also had to sell the assistant coach that was recruiting. Well, a lot of guys already know the assistant coach in this case, which is Wes, and you know, so now he only has to worry about selling the other two things. So he's always going to be in with key recruits, and I think he does a great job. What's been the biggest challenge for you since you got the job? <laughs> the biggest challenge? Oh, I, I think the one thing that I want to make sure that I was do was like establishing a culture of accountability, and, and that's probably been the biggest challenge so far. And, and the one thing guys haven't done is they haven't fought me on that, but just like, you know, it, it guys want to pat on the back for doing the things they're supposed to do. Like, you know, they came in, like, you know, Coach, I was on time for my tutor appointment. I'm like, well, you're supposed to be on time for your tutor appointment. Those are the things you do. And so, you know, I, I think having a culture of accountability and trying to establish those things as far as, like, doing things the right way and handling the business on a daily basis. Because first and foremost, you're there to be a student, and the next thing is to be an athlete. And, and 
it's hard to manage those things at times. So, like, we're trying to bless the opportunity and make sure you take advantage of it. But just making sure that we hold our guys accountable for all their actions, both on and off the court, it's probably been the most difficult thing to do. Not because the kids have fought it, but just, you know, it's, it's something new to me. Rick, do you feel like yeah, not more so about like the, the profession or the job or anything like that, but more so like I talk to Conzo all the time because we're friends. Right. You know, we worked together for two years at Purdue and like I have a great deal of respect for Conzo. He really taught me how to be a better person as far as like how I handle my business with coaching. You know, it used to be all consuming for me. Conzo told me taught me how to like put that aside and be able to go home and still be a parent and still go home and be a husband. You know, so don't let this whole game, you know, like consume me. And so like I really appreciate the fact that I was around Conzo and I learned something from him. But as far as like the day-to-day -day operations and things like that, I've talked to him and we've reached out, but like it's no different from me talking to Conzo now when I was at Clemson and when I was at Purdue. You know, we still talk to him and reach out to each other. And now you gotta be a little careful, you know. One time like he, he got a really good recruit, obviously I came down and recruit and I called him and congratulated him. And then after I was sitting around talking to him for about five minutes, I was like, Whoa, hold on. We got to pay against that. Gonna be cool. <laughs> so I probably shouldn't be so happy for right, him. Right. But uh, that's just the type of relationship that we had. Did, did he offer you any advice of just, you know, the, the overwhelming aspects of going to this level and just what it means to kind of be the, the face of a program of that size? Well, no, the biggest thing he says is like, you know, whether you're an assistant coach or a head coach, you know, you're either a good coach or a bad coach. And he says, like, you know, you've been in a situation where you work for some really good guys and you have some strong beliefs and, you know, the things that you've done in the past as an assistant coach, they'll work as a head coach. You just got to go in and implement it. He said, just believe in your system and believe in yourself and make sure you don't ever give up on those core values that you have and you'll be all right. Yeah, so it is. Sometimes I wonder if my wife is going to be rooting for me or rooting for Conzo. <laughs> Rick, you've been part of transition processes that, as an assistant, you know, at both Purdue and Clemson, but you know, your first head coaching job allowed you to have access to your players in the summer and in the fall. And did that? I don't know if you'll know this till the end of the year, maybe. But did you feel like that's been an added bonus for you as a first-year head coach, having that type of access? Well, I, I think it's in a situation like mine where I was coming in as a new head coach. Um, I don't think there's a, a no doubt in my mind that like having access to my guys in the summertime is a, is a bonus and a plus. You know, um, the guys are there anyway. I, I thought it made a lot of sense by the NCAA to go ahead and give us those access to our players since they're there anyway. You know, it used to be like the strength and conditioning coach was the only person that had a say so as far as like how your guys worked and you know their day to day habits because we couldn't touch them on their day to day habits as far as like you know anything off the court. Um, but now, like we're in the situation now, we have that access. We're able to be around our guys. We'll be able to teach those guys the way we want to go about our business, both on and off the court. And more importantly, you get a chance to start working with your guys, and now they don't have to go through outside sources as far as like trying to develop their own game. What do you think of the way the SEC's put together this 18-game schedule with, the, with 14 teams? Just, it's kind of hard to follow what, what's going on. Just, just you know, I don't think it's a big deal at all. Like, when you're playing in a conference like the SEC, you're going to have a difficult schedule no matter how they put it together. You know, like, you're playing in the BCS, high major conference. No matter what they end up doing, the schedule's going to be daunting. It's going to be difficult. Um, for me, the most important thing in the scheduling process is they, they kept the rivalry with us and Ole Miss alive. So we're always going to play, you know, Ole Miss twice. And I think that's the most important thing in all the scheduling. So, you know, how they plan the scheduling now, I think, is immaterial to me because, like, we're going to play good teams no matter what the schedule turns out to be. With Kentucky winning a national championship last year, you know, uh, team that was top 10 last year was already coming in. Do you think the profile of this league is rising nationally? Yeah, I, I think that this is a, a conference that's going to have six or seven NCAA tournament teams. You know, like I think adding Missouri, adding Texas A&M has been a bonus for us. But obviously the exposure that Kentucky gives us as far as like going out and winning the national championship and, you know, the way they continue to go as far as recruiting and like having, you know, all access on the ESPN. I think those things are all benefit for our league because now people – they want to play against the Kentucky, you know, they want to play against the Missouri. So I think anytime somebody in your league has success, you know, it helps.
Rick, you don't look at the all-access thing and kind of shake your head and go, well, gee, this, this is just kind of promoting this league as Kentucky and everybody else. No, I don't think so at all. I mean, I think at the end of the day, like, you know, you're recruiting the guys that you're going to recruit. So, like, whether Kentucky has an all-access thing that talks about recruits and things like that, does it change the way we recruit or our recruiting habits? I don't think it makes any difference at all. Sorry you've already been asked this, but have you had any contact with Coach Stansberry at all? Uh, no, I have not. Okay. Mm-hmm. Just talk about Wendell. I mean, only big guy that really played last year. Just talk about what you've seen from him so far. You know, the thing about Wendell is first and foremost, he lost some weight. You know, like I was looking at highlight tapes when I was going into recruits homes and uh, seeing like it's a noticeable difference that he's lost, you know, 10 to 15 pounds. Um, the other thing about Wendell Lewis, he has an SEC body, he has SEC athleticism, so he is a presence. You know, the thing now is like, can Wendell handle the, the load of being the key guy in the post? You know, and for us, like, we want the ball to go into the paint. We want the ball to go into the post. And for the most part, Wendell Lewis is going to be like a one-on-one type guy. He's not going to be the type of guy where other teams are going to be going to double and then try to take the ball out of his hands. So he's going to have some scoring opportunities one-on-one. So what we want from him is to take advantage of those scoring opportunities by getting the ball in the paint and making plays. And I think he's more than capable of doing it. But now his mentality has to change, you know, not only as far as, like, being a guy who's trying to score but also being competitive. Where does Gavin Ware fit in, in the post? Yeah. Well, you know, for most of our guys, if you're on the team, you're pretty much going to play right now. You know, <laughs> we're, we're short on numbers. And so, like, you know, Gavin's going to have the opportunity to play. You know, there's, you know, no matter how good Wendell Lewis is, he's not going to play 40 minutes a game. And then you got the situation with foul trouble and things like that. So the biggest factor with, you know, with Gavin Ware right now is he lost about 25 pounds. And so now he has the ability to go out and play the way we want to play. Um, but uh, I, I'm really excited excited about Gavin Ware because he's handled everything he's supposed to handle as far as being both responsible on and off the court. Um, but, like, he's got a big old body. You know, like, if he ducks in and he, like, you know, wipes out and gets post position, there's not very many guys who can keep from getting around him. So, you know, what we're trying to do now is, like, get the mentality of, like, getting the ball inside to Gavin and letting him take advantage of those opportunities that he's going to get. So we expect Gavin to be a big part of our team this year, and we really expect a lot of them in the future. How did you and your guys react to the prediction of finishing last in the league this year? You know what? I haven't even talked to my guys about it. The first time I heard about it was, you know, maybe a couple days ago and things like that. And I don't make much predictions. I think, you know, Tennessee was picked to finish 11th last year, and they finished second. So, you know, it is what it is. Rick, what you talk you, uh, about What did you take from your Big Ten experience, your ACC experience, now you're in the SEC? What do you take from those other coaching stops? Well, I, I think the biggest thing is just what I learned underneath those guys that I was at. You know, like I, I think I've been fortunate to work from some unbelievably good coaches. You know, I think Matt Payne is a three-time Big Ten Coach of the Year. You know, and so like you're talking about some guys like Tom Izzo, Bill Ryan, Thad Modelik. You know, people thought so much of Matt Payne that they voted him to be Big Ten Coach of the Year three times. So I've taken a wealth of knowledge from him. You know, Brad Brownell is a guy that's probably not thought of in, like, in media terms or things like that. But in the coaching ranks, you know, he's really well respected as far as like, his knowledge and grasp what X's and O's. And so the biggest experiences I took from them, you know, being in the Big Ten, being in the ACC, was working for guys like that. Rick, I think it's fair maybe to say that what Kwanzo did last year was, was take that Big Ten mentality to the SEC and prove you can play that type of defense in this league and, and referees will adapt to you. Do you feel that way? I mean, I know you guys are really concentrating on what is a foul and what's not a foul. Um, is that kind of part of your mindset of I, I, we can play physical, we can bump guys on screens through the post, we can do this in the SEC? I, I don't know more so if we're trying to take a mentality into the SEC, but more so like this is the way I've been taught how to play basketball and it's the way like I'm going to teach my team how to play basketball. You know, I don't know any other way but to play tough, you know, hard-nosed physical basketball. And so, you know, hopefully it's as acceptable, you know, in the SEC, you know. We got to be careful, like I said, because we're short on numbers. But I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to play that way. So it's not me trying to change the way the SEC plays or trying to bring something to the SEC. It's just simply put that that's the way we're going to play. We're going to play physical. How long do you think it will take you to attract the kind of players 
to uh, get your program you know, back up and, and competing? Well, I don't think it'll take very long, you know, just on the recruiting front right now. I think we've done an excellent job of bringing in guys right away. You know, the thing is, I think we have some really good players right now in our program. They're just young and inexperienced, you know, and usually the young and inexperienced guys, you know, they have a situation where they can go in and learn from some veteran guys. Where well, our young and inexperienced guys don't have that opportunity because, first and foremost, guys that are experienced in our program, they've never been in our program before. You know, they may have some experience, but they haven't been underneath us. Um, so, like, guys like Craig Sward, you know, we call him Chicken, um, Gavin Ware, and, you know, and Fred Thomas, I think, are going to be really good SEC basketball players. But now they got to grow up really fast. And I think what we've done already on the recruiting trail as far as, like, the guys we've got committed to us in the 2013 class – you know, going to be, really be difference makers for us next year. And I just think what we need more than anything is we need competition at each position. And then we also just need more bodies, you know, like just simply having more bodies will make us better. So I think we're on the right track already.